If you have your Bibles this morning and you want to go ahead and turn, we're going to be in, again, the Gospel of John, where we looked at last week. We're going to be in the second chapter this morning. Uh, if you were here last week, I mentioned that I had basically just felt led by the Spirit for us in the next few weeks just to get back to the basics, just the foundation, the cornerstone of what our faith is all about, what the Christian faith is all about, and that is Jesus Christ. And of course, last week in the first chapter of John, we looked at who Jesus is. We know that Jesus was not just some great magician that fooled a lot of people during his time, that Jesus just wasn't a very, very good, great teacher, that Jesus wasn't even the greatest prophet throughout all of history. And we also looked at who Jesus is not last week. There are so many people all throughout history who have claimed to be a Messiah or to be a Savior. And one thing we heard last week is that the thing that all of those people have in common is that they are all dead now. And then we also looked at last week the purpose, the reason for Jesus coming into this world, coming to earth. Today I want to continue looking at the signs, the evidence that Jesus is who he says he is. You know, a lot of many different opinions, a lot of many different views in the world today about who Jesus is. But also, there are a lot of many different, a lot of many, that makes a sense. Huh? There are many different opinions and views, even in the church, as to who Jesus is. But we need to determine who Jesus is, what he was all about, strictly by God's word. We don't need to read in our own interpret interpretation of what we think or who we think Jesus is, but we need to get directly from God's word is who Jesus is, the only begotten Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one. In, in this John 2nd chapter, and, and I know in your program it says beginning in verse 13, but if you'll bear with me this morning, I feel like it's important. I want to go back to the first verse. And so we're going to begin this morning reading from the first verse. And of course, this begins with Jesus' very first miracle as he's at the beginning, at the start of his ministry. And it says here on verse 1, On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. And Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. And when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. And Jesus said to her, Dear woman, why do you involve me? My time has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Well, nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, and each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. And so they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. And they did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. And he did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. And then he called the bridegroom aside and he said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best until now. This is the first of his miraculous signs Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. And then in verse 12 here, it says, After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. And there they stayed for a few days. And when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And in the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. And so he made a whip out of cords, and he drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those he sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? And his disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. And then the Jews demanded of him, What miraculous sign can you show us 
to prove your authority to do all this. And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. So the Jews, just like many people in this world today, when confronted with Jesus and, and who he is, many people have that same attitude. They say, show us some sign. Show us some miraculous sign. Some of you may even had opportunities to witness to people, to share about Christ with people. And you may have gotten that response. Well, I, I just can't really believe in anything that I don't see. If you'll show me some proof or show me some evidence, then I might believe. And we see all throughout the New Testament, all throughout Jesus' ministry here on this earth, many of those people of that day say, show us some evidence, show us some proof, and then we will believe. And of course, Jesus, knowing their hearts, as a matter of fact, if you look later on in this chapter, look in verse 24, or 23. It says, while he was in Jerusalem at Passover feast, many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing, and they believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. He did not need man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in a man. He knew people's hearts. He knew those, and He still knows those today who might say, I believe in Jesus, or I believe in God. But He really honestly knows what's in their heart. And do they truly believe? Because if you believe something, then you're going to follow up with it. You're going to live as if you believe something. And there are too many people in this world, and even some even in the church, that say, I believe this, or I believe Jesus, or I believe God, but there are too many that are not living like they believe. I want to look at this morning three signs that we see in this passage, again, proving the deity of Jesus Christ, who He truly is. And the first thing we see in this passage is, is first of all, Jesus' glory revealed. In verses 1 through 11 that we begin reading, of course, we're given the account of Jesus' first miracle. And you've got to realize that this is soon after his baptism. This is soon after his temptation by Satan in the wilderness. This is very soon after he has chosen his initial disciples, those first 12 disciples. We're told in verse 1, it says, on the third day. Now, we're not totally sure the third day after what? But what we do know about this is this is the very start, the very beginning of Jesus' ministry on this earth. And this first miracle that we read about that Jesus performed, this is just the beginning of many more signs and many more miraculous works that Jesus will do on this earth. And so Jesus and his mother Mary and his disciples, they're all invited to attend this wedding. And they run out of wine. And of course, this was normal for the day. And, and I don't want to get into a discussion. I, I've heard many messages about uh, pastors who might get off on, okay, well, was this alcoholic wine? Was it non-alcoholic wine? And, and we're not going to get into that today, okay? But basically, Jesus' mother goes to, or Mary goes to Jesus and says, they run out of wine. Now, it's very interesting to me why Mary went to Jesus with this problem. I mean, we know that there, there's a host of this banquet. And, and we're really kind of assuming, like it is today, this is, you know, preliminary. might call it the, the rehearsal supper, okay, for the actual wedding to take place. And Mary, instead of going to the host or the bridegroom's family who is hosting all of this and saying, you've run out of wine, have y'all got any more wine? She goes to Jesus. And tells him the issue, tells him the problem that's going on here. And then Jesus' response in verse 4 is very, very interesting. It says that Jesus looked at his mother and he says, Dear woman, why are you involving me? <laughs> As if Jesus is saying, this isn't my party. I'm just a guest here just like anybody else is. So why are you bringing this problem to me? And then Jesus also says this, my time has not yet come. Now what time is Jesus talking about here? 
Well, just very simply, Jesus is referring to the time as the time where he would be ultimately glorified as the Messiah, as the Son of God. If you remember in John chapter 17, and this is where Jesus is praying in the garden just right before he's arrested, right before he's taken to trial before Pilate, and, and uh, right before he's crucified on the cross. And Jesus, part of his prayer, he looks to heaven and he prays. He says, Father, the time has now come. Glorify your son so that your son may glorify you. Jesus is talking about the time, the ultimate purpose and reason for his ministry on this earth, where he would be put to death, where he would be sent to die on the cross for your sin and for my sin. I had the opportunity to talk with a couple of our children this morning who are in the process of making decisions and making their profession of faith. And we talked about that punishment of sin, which is death. And I said, it would be just like your sister or your brother. I, I said, if you ever got a spanking, they said, one of them said, a few. And I said, what if you got in trouble and you were about to get a spanking and your brother or your sister stepped in and said, no, mom and dad, spank me instead. I said, that's exactly what Jesus did for you when he died for your sin. He took, he paid the punishment for your sin. So that we wouldn't have to pay the punishment for our sin. And that's where Jesus would ultimately be glorified. And glorify his heavenly father. So his heavenly father in turn would glorify him. And so then Mary does something very interesting after this. She points out the problem to Jesus. And then in verse 5, she goes to the servants and she just says to them, Do what he, Jesus, tells you to do. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? She knows Jesus can handle the situation. <laughs> Mary knows who her own son is. That he was the promised Messiah, the Savior of the world. She knew that. She believed that in her heart. And so she looks at these servants again. She doesn't go to the host of the banquet. She doesn't go to the bridegroom or the family. But she goes to the servants there who are working this wedding party and she says, you do what Jesus tells you to do. Let me tell you this, folks, this morning. Jesus has a plan and a purpose for each and every person here in this room. And daily I would say, He is telling each and every one of you, do what I tell you to do. And if you are truly a follower and a disciple of Jesus Christ this morning, you and I, we are His servants. And as His servants, this same command that Mary gave to the servants of the party, this same command should be spoken of all of us that we are to do whatever He, Jesus, tells us to do. And you know, that's a very simple instruction. Doesn't it amaze you sometimes as parents or even as grandparents of your parents or grandparents and you tell your children or your grandchildren you need to go do something and it's like they don't understand that word. I mean, it's, it's, it's a simple word, is it not? Go do. Do without delaying. Do without arguing. Do without lingering. Listen to what I'm asking you to do and take action. Obey. Do. And the same can be said of each and every one of us as followers and believers of Jesus Christ. When he says, do whatever I tell you to do, we shouldn't linger. We shouldn't delay. We shouldn't argue about it. We should just simply do. And here we see in this miracle a glimpse of Jesus' glory. The glory of God the Father, His Heavenly Father. And that Jesus states one day He will be fully glorified. But today, in this circumstance, and if you're following along with your notes, here's the first item on your notes. By taking water and turning it into wine, there is just a small glimpse into the glory that God the Father will ultimately bring upon His Son through His death and resurrection. The second thing we see here in this passage this morning 
First of all, Jesus' glory revealed, but certainly we see His power revealed. And of course, this is obvious. His divine power revealed through this miracle. His first miracle. And if you look in verse 6 as we read, it says there were six stone vessels, each one holding about 20 or 30 gallons. I mean, that's got to be some big pots now. Okay, to hold 20 or 30 gallons. Those are big. And there's six of them there, and they're all empty, but it says that they were there for ceremonial washing. Now just picture this this moment. These six stone vessels, I believe, could certainly be representative of the unbeliever. For the person who continues to live a life of sin, who continues to serve self. Because that type of person has a heart that is hard towards Jesus Christ and towards the conviction of the Holy Spirit in their life. And so you've got these six stone vessels there. And it says used for ceremonial washing. Now this ceremonial washing was nothing but just a ritual. I mean it was just like, you know, we go through the ritual, or at least I hope we do, when we get ready to sit down and have a meal, that we go through and we cleanse, we wash our hands. Okay? Now that is very important. And we see that in Scripture. Obviously to God it was very important because that was actually part of the law. Before a person entered into the temple to worship, they would go through a ceremonial washing process. Before the high priest would enter the most holy place once a year to atone for the sins of the people, he would go through days of a ceremonial washing process. But it was a ritual. It was just a cleansing of the outside. There was no spiritual cleansing involved in this whatsoever. But through Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, those who are these stone hard vessels, whose hearts are hard, a repentant unbeliever, are filled with the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. That is the only way there is true inward spiritual cleansing. And that is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ that covers all of our sins. In verse 7, we see Jesus. He tells the servants, fill the jars. And the servants fill them up. And this is very important. It says they filled them to the brim. You notice when they were told by Jesus, given these instructions, they didn't just do it half-heartedly. They didn't just do it halfway. They did it to the max, to the brim. And I think still for so many believers, for so many who profess to be Christian, they only want to be Christian halfway. They only want to be filled with God's Spirit halfway. They only want to tap into the power of the Holy Spirit halfway. Because they still like that control. They still like being in power themselves. But folks, when we ask the Holy Spirit to come and to reside in our hearts and our lives, we just say, fill me to the brim, to the top. Fill me to the max. Just as these servants did here. And if we're somewhere between the filling of these vessels and the drawing out from them, this miracle takes place. And the water is turned into wine. Isn't that just like God? Is that when we do what He leads us to do, and we are obedient, and we follow through wholly and completely, He takes care of the need and abundantly provides. But the big requirement is this. We have to do it to the max. And we have to be obedient. When he says do, we have to obey and do and take action. Here's the second item on your notes this morning. When we do what the Lord would have us do, miraculous things will happen. Now you know a lot of times when we talk about miracles, we think about You know, big things. Just totally unexplained things. But I want you to hear this morning. When we do what the Lord asks us to do, 
The Lord's power is at work and miraculous things will happen. Now you may not think those miraculous things that I'm referring to are big enough to be called a miracle. But I will tell you this morning, when God's at work, if He is involved, then it's always a miraculous thing to witness and to experience and to be part of. No matter how big or how small the thing may be. So here's the last thing we see in this passage about who Jesus truly is. First, His glory revealed, His divine power revealed, and finally, His divine authority is revealed. Beginning in verse 13 through verse 19 that we read. Of course, we see Jesus going into the temple in Jerusalem. And He sees the abuse, the misuse of what's going on in this temple. And of course, Jesus becomes angry at what's taking place. Now some will raise the question, well, isn't it a sin to be angry? And if it is, did Jesus sin at this moment when He got angry? Well, absolutely not. And i tell you why. There's nothing wrong with being angry at unrighteousness. There's nothing wrong with being angry at sin. Whether it's sin in our personal life or whether it's sin in the world. We should be angry at those things. We should care enough about those things that first of all, if it's in our own life, that we want to get it straight between us and God. And then the second, if it's anger at what's going on in the world and the sin and the evil and, and the wickedness in the world around us, to be angry and get out and do something about it. There's nothing wrong with being angry at unrighteousness. But Jesus overturns these table of the thieves and that's exactly what they were. They were taking advantage of people coming into worship, coming in to offer sacrifices that were required by the law. And so they were just simply thieves. In other gospel accounts, Jesus says that they turned His Father's house into a den of thieves. In verse 17, as Jesus overturns the tables, we're told that verse 17 says His disciples remembered these words. And these words are taken from Psalm 69 where it says, Zeal for your house will consume me. What is your attitude towards coming to the Lord's house to worship? Is it a ritual? Is it just a weekly, another weekly part of your schedule? Or do you come to the Lord's house on Sundays and or Wednesdays or any time you get the opportunity, do you come to the Lord's house to worship with zeal? And does that zeal consume you? Do you have that hunger to come and to worship and to sing praises to Him and to hear from His Word and to read His Word and to study His Word? Do you have that zeal? Or do you just come to look good? Or do you just come just to get your spiritual tank refilled so you can make it through another week? Or does zeal for the house of the Lord consume you? In Psalm 69, which is where this comes from, it basically says this, and it's another prophetic passage all throughout the Old Testament, one of the prophetic passages regarding the one true Messiah, Jesus Christ. It says this, I am a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my own mother's son. Do you know Jesus' own siblings? They would not even accept Him or believe in Him. They didn't until after His resurrection. They were part of the crowd that often mocked and ridiculed and teased Jesus. His own brothers, His own sisters, His own siblings. And so there, again, a prophetic passage about Jesus is in that verse. And then it says in verse 9 of Psalm 69, For zeal for your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. Jesus was all about His Father's business. He was all about giving honor and glory to His Heavenly Father. So much so that He gave His life and He died freely and willingly as the perfect, as we talked about last week, the perfect spotless Lamb of God who should not have had to die. But He did die in our place. 
And all of those insults, all of that ridicule, all of that beating, all of that mocking, those crown of thorns that were shoved upon his head, he took all of that for us. They were hurled upon him instead of hurled upon us. See, this event here, as Jesus cleans out the temple, cleans out his father's house, this reveals the divine authority that only Christ had and has. Jesus himself said in Matthew 28, 18, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Notice he didn't say, I claim or I take all authority in heaven and on earth. He said, it's been given to me. Been given to him as the only begotten Son of God and was given to him alone and nobody else and nobody else throughout history. And in verse 19, Jesus already talks about a future miracle. That ultimate miracle that we will see to culminate the ministry of Jesus on this earth. In verse 19, look what it says. Jesus said, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. And then jump down to verse 21. We get an explanation of what he's talking about there. He says the temple he had spoken of was his body. Jesus is talking about his own crucifixion. He's talking about that miracle of death's defeat through his divine authority. The divine authority given to him by his father that he would have to conquer death and to conquer the grave. And here's the last note. Jesus was able to defeat death and the grave because He, being God, has authority to do so. Even today, He still has the authority to defeat dead, death and the grave. And through believing and trusting in Him, you have that same power, that same authority with the presence of the Spirit in your life to conquer and de to defeat death and the grave. Now, I don't know this morning what decision or what choice any of you in this place today have made when it comes to Jesus Christ. If you've never made a decision or if you've never chosen Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you are making a choice and that choice is you're just simply choosing to reject Him. But you need to choose Him. There is only one way to the Father and it's through Him. There's only one all throughout history whose glory of the Father, glory of God was revealed through and that is Christ. There was only one all throughout history whose power, whose divine power was revealed. And that was the person of Jesus Christ. And there was only one all throughout history whose divine authority was revealed. And again, the authority given to Him from heaven, that was Jesus Christ. There's an old hymn Probably most of you have never even heard of it or heard of these words. And it's not in our Baptist hymnal. And quite honestly, I don't know that it was ever found in a Baptist hymnal at any time. I know it's been in Presbyterian hymnals and Lutheran hymnals. But listen to the words of this hymn, just the very first verse. It says, Come to the Savior, make no delay. Here in His Word, He's shown us the way. Here in our midst, He is standing right here today. Tenderly saying, come. Let me pray.